And joining us now to talk urban development, the mayor of Portland, Oregon, Sam Adams. And we'll, we'll dispense with the jokes about how you should be named the mayor of Boston. <laughs> you know, the name like Sam Adams, you ought to be the mayor of Boston. You know well, that. I love being the mayor of Portland, Oregon. I Thank, you thanks for having me. Now, here we call our mayors your worship. What do they call them there? Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Just Sam, eh? At now, least what that's they really the way call? I like it. What's the title, uh, though? The Honorable. The Honorable. But okay. nobody uses that. They I'm just, going with Sam. I prefer Sam. Let's, one of the reasons you're visiting our capital city here in Ontario, and we wanted to get you in here to talk about how different cities uh, develop, and I guess the best analogy for this province, you're a city of about 600,000 in Portland? Correct. Directly, and so Correct. that's about Mississauga, Hamilton, Ontario, about that size. Uh, just take us back to sort of the end of World War II and tell mm -hmm. us, you know, generally speaking, how Portland, you know, emerged from the war and, and has changed over the years. Well, we emerged uh, from World War II like a lot of cities, um, you know, hell, hell, heck bent on, uh, <laughs> on uh, owning a car and being able to drive everywhere. And so we ripped out our streetcars. Um, there was a private transportation system. The public took it over. Um, this was a common theme in cities across the United States. Um, and we, we were just a typical American auto-oriented city up until the 1970s. Stop we, there, because I'll, I'll, I'll bring you along to the 1970s. Okay. But we, did you experience the kind of uh, rusting out of your downtowns and, you know, like d downtown went decrepit like so many American cities it, did? It hollowed out it like every other downtown. In the United States, the more auto-oriented um, locale cities, metro regions became and sprawl started. And people stopped living there and all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We actually um, lost population um, until probably 19, got back to, I should say, until probably the 1990, early 1990s. Huh. Okay. So you, again, then, let me take you back to the 1970s. And there's a, new, there's a new way of thinking happening in the 1970s about how to redesign the city? Yeah. In the, in the mid-1970s, Portlanders got fed up with the highway building sort of uh, theme of the time, uh, a new highway, sl highway was slated to go through two different neighborhoods across the city. Um, neighborhoods just rose up and said, enough. Um, and out of that came eventually Portland um, adding, instead of getting the money for uh, freeways or highways, we used the money for light rail. About that same time in the 1970s then, we had a freeway right next to the river. And uh, a governor, Governor Tom McCall, uh, with city leadership, uh, dug the freeway up, and that's now our riverfront park. So those two things together in the 1970s combined with, at the state level, uh, the establishment of aggressive land use laws and the creation of an urban growth boundary that helped protect farm and forest land from the sprawl that, that the city had been experiencing, the region had been experiencing, uh, from the end of World War II up to the 1970s. Why do you think Portland took an approach that was obviously pretty different from what many other big American cities did at the time? At, at the time, those that were around say that it was really out of the conservation ethic of uh, farm forest land. At that time, uh, Oregon was one of the top producers of lumber forest, um, huge agricultural um, uh, production in the Willamette Valley and in Eastern Oregon. So it really came out of that conservation ethic of you know, protecting the natural environment. Uh, I think there were some sort of far, you know, far-sighted people that also saw that the, the winnowing out, the hollowing out of the central core of the region uh, could be tamed, could be ameliorated by establishing an urban growth boundary and, and strong and tough land use laws. I found a quote of yours where you say, a great transportation system never guarantees a great city, but a lousy transportation system always guarantees a lousy one. And again, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you yeah. is that we're going through enormous debates about public transit use in this city, and you guys seem to get a lot of good notices for having done it right. Hmm. What's going on there? Well, we really, uh, with the establishment in the 1970s of land use and with the um, advent of bringing back fixed rail transit, initially light rail, and, and after that streetcar, um, we've had a lot of success at uh, re, you know, keeping a lid on gridlock um, because we plan our transit and our long-term land use planning and, our tra and transportation and transit investments all together. So stationary development um, is really important to us. Our light rail has a separate 
uh, right away. So regardless of what the freeway is doing, it has its own reliable timetable. So this is not like streetcars where they've got to fight in traffic like everybody else. Correct. So light rail in, in Portland stops about every two miles. It's speedy. It's reliable. Uh, it's convenient. We've worked hard in the region in and outside the city because it extends to the outer uh, edges of the region to make sure that around each stop we have the kind of uh, mixed-use development of housing, retail, uh, restaurants, the kinds of amenities that every neighborhood wants. We do that in a way that is compact around those stations so that it does it protects the single-family neighborhoods that are already there beyond you know, the immediate uh, three to five blocks around each station. That in turn in improves the quality of life for the existing single family neighborhoods, whether they ever get on, on light rail or not. But I guess if, it's, if it stops every two miles, uh, it's really operating more like a subway than a, than a streetcar, isn't it? Because that's a lot of distance between stops. It, it definitely is, is uh, its focus is on moving people, no question, mm -hmm. uh, quickly and reliably. Uh, streetcar, on the other hand, is really about, uh, it, it stops every two blocks, right. it's a smaller car. Do you have those as well? We have streetcars as well. We were the first U.S. city to bring back modern streetcars. Um, no subways, though. Uh, we don't have subways, um, and we have no subways planned. Um, we have a lot more success with surface transit, either with its own dedicated separated right-of-way or streetcar that is a mixture, it mostly shares the lane with automobiles, some dedicated. Um, our streetcar, our first leg of streetcar was about seven miles, and we paid $125 million for it. Uh, within four blocks of that streetcar, we've had $3.5 billion in private investment, um, over half of the city's... Uh... I got the numbers. Stay oh, you right. do? Yeah, okay, no, 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 sorry. I was going to put sorry. them up. Well, we actually, just hold on, Michael, before I put the numbers up. I didn't hear buses as a part of that mix. No, buses are a definite part of that mix, and we also have uh, aerial tram that connects some strange geography mountains and we also have now commuter rail in the suburbs. Huh. Okay, here are the numbers. This is the case that Portland makes uh, for, the, uh, for the streetcar. $3.5 billion invested within two blocks of the streetcar alignment, uh, more than 10,000 new housing units, 5.4 million square feet of office, institutional, retail, hotel construction constructed within two blocks of the alignment. 55% of all central business district development since 1997 has occurred within one block of the streetcar. So I guess the gist of this thing is it pays for itself and more. It, it more than pays for itself. In terms of streetcar, you, we have not found a better public investment in terms of private sector return. Where can you spend $125 million on virtually anything and get $3.5 billion in private investment? How do you know it's all attributable to that? We, had, we hired an outside uh, consultant to do the, to do the before and after uh, to make sure that you know, we took out anything that was subsidized because some of that uh, development also included deeply subsidized affordable housing. We didn't just want to gentrify, you know, our city. We wanted to make complete neighborhoods. And part of our definition of co complete neighborhoods were parks, was high income housing in the same building or across the street from some of the most subsidized affordable housing as well. Now, did you get the state or the federal government to help you with that 125 million bucks? Only since then. We had some state help, but it is only since then that the state and and the feds now are full partners in our funding. We've gone on to, uh, we're in the midst of uh, creating a loop in our central city that will go on both sides of our river. Um, and we, that is half paid for by local resources and half paid for by uh, federal resources. So, so does now, local resources mean property taxes entirely? Uh, it means a variety of things. Uh, uh, local improvement districts, which will be a one-time tax on the properties that are going to benefit most, and the value of property around streetcar, for example, or on light rail stops have shown to appreciate. That's why it's important to have a complete approach and make sure that affordability is built in, and that's part of the cost-benefit. Um, we include uh, our local gas taxes, we include um, urban renewal funds, which is a type of funding that's available to many cities. It's all local funds. So your city has a gas tax? Our city does not have a gas it tax. Doesn't. We use our portion of the gas tax that we get uh, from the state. The state collects okay. the gas tax and then allocates it back. Well, Ontario municipalities are going to be licking their chops at Chelsea. Oh, is that right? I, well, I don't think they get that here. Uh, um, we're trying to figure out whether or not your experience can be replicated in other jurisdictions. Mm. And one of the 
things I guess I want to hone in on now is how you govern yourselves and whether that makes it easier or harder. Mm -hmm. You've got five commissioners, right? And you're one of the five. That's right. That's it. It's the mayor and four commissioners. Elected citywide, nonpartisan, four-year terms, full-time jobs. That's city council? That's city council. That's it? That's it. Okay, because in Toronto we have 45. The mayor is one of 45. Mm. Uh, what, you know, obviously you're not an expert on Toronto's governance model, but would, does it suggest to you that with that kind of governance model in place, it's pretty hard to do anything big and bold? Well, you know, uh, uh, my answer to that question, I, I, I don't know, um, because I don't know your, your governance. Uh, I don't know uh, the details of everything that you're facing beyond what I read in the press. Um, but it's got to be easier to convince three people to go along with you than 20, whatever, half of 45 is my math is, but 20, uh, No question three. about it. But it's, it, no question about it, but it's a lot easier when you, you know, when you seek to tackle a problem on a strategic basis. You know, I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be promoting streetcar for my own city or light rail or any other uh, investment in transportation if I didn't see the value proposition. You know, when I can when I can grow the tax base, you know, with private investment of three point five billion dollars with a hundred and twenty five million dollar investment, that's a good return. Mm -hmm. um, and we put everything we do, our efforts are to put everything we do through that kind of a rigor. Um, we don't have the political support to knock down neighborhoods and widen roads. And yet we have concerns about gridlock, you know, like every city has concerns about gridlock. Um, and so we seek to use the right-of-way that we already have, operationally and otherwise, in the smartest way possible. And it's usually a combination of different things. In different parts of town, there's a different weighting to the combination. Um, light rail has worked really well in our central city. Um, we just went through, though, a 25-year master planning for light rail. And now the biggest complaint I got was you know, that the neighborhoods outside the downtown you know, wanted it, and they wanted it now. And the complaint was, why aren't you out building light rail uh, in my neighborhood? It didn't start out that way, you know, just like light rail didn't necessarily start out popular either. You have vowed to make Portland the most sustainable city in the world. That's right. What does that mean? Well, Portland is a living laboratory. You know, we're not, uh, we're not a, we're a big town. We're not, uh, you know, not as big as Seattle. We're certainly not as big as San Francisco. We have to be scrappy. We have to be strategic. Um, as a living laboratory, you know, it's not enough for us, for example, on streetcars to simply bring back streetcars, even with all that private sector redevelopment, um, we monetize our innovations in livability. And now we're making streetcars and selling them to about 80 cities in the United States that are seeking to br bring back modern streetcars as well. Hmm. So we have, to be, we have to be scrappy. Does it make it easier to do that, given that you're not a Seattle or a San Francisco, which are bigger cities and presumably harder to govern as a result? I don't think our success comes from the size of the city. Um, we have conservative neighborhoods. We have liberal neighborhoods. We're surrounded by you know, liberal and conservative communities as well. We, we have a regional government, so a lot of our decision making is also done on a regional basis. Uh, we really try to apply the facts and make inspired decisions based on the facts. Um, we don't do subways, for example, because they're five times the cost mm -hmm. of surface rail. But we do seek to have the benefits of subways by that separated track, you know, that can't be gummed up by traffic congestion. So we're always trying to think through how much, you know, multiple benefits that we can get from every dollar that we have. You we just tolls? don't have a lot of dollars. Sure. You got tolls on your highways? No. 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 Uh, to the extent that you had heard of Toronto or yes. knew of Toronto. Oh, I've been here before. Okay. It's a great city. It is, eh? It's a What's wonderful city. What's the reputation city. that it has on the west coast of the United States? Uh, well, Toronto is known for being a very innovative city, uh, especially in recent years, that is a major financial capital, um, an economic force, uh, an international city. Green? It's, uh, it's known um, in terms of the triple bottom line of environmental, economic, and social justice. It's definitely known for being uh, sort of post-race relations in the sense that this is a very integrated city among the races. It's definitely known for that kind of harmony. It's definitely known as an economic power. It's known in most recent years for being a place of innovation around clean technology. So let me ask you one last thing, and that is if, let's, let's take as a given here for a second, since I'm sure you're going to tell me it's the case, that the Portland experience is something good and potentially exportable. If it is exportable, what are the conditions that need to be in place on the ground of other cities if they want to be more like your city? Well, it's just, it's common sense. You know, if you're going to spend 
uh, a whole lot of money, public money on anything, make sure that you're getting multiple benefits from it. The day of the one-offs are long gone. When it comes to transportation investments, uh, whether it's for new auto lanes, and, and I was a transportation, has been a transportation commissioner that approved a freeway expansion um, in parts of the city where it showed it was needed. You know, I'm uh, beware of folks that have sort of a theatric, you know, uh, uh, sloganeering from either the left or the right. Uh, ask what the cost is, ask what the benefit is. That kind of approach is really just radical common sense, and it's not about being a Portlander. You can do it anywhere. Gotcha. That's the Honorable Sam Adams, Mayor of Portland, Oregon. Calls himself Sam. Thanks for visiting us here at TVO tonight. Appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you, Steve.